Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I'm your host today, and we're going to be talking about the basics of cybersecurity acronyms and adding some new ones to your vernacular that you may find very useful. So hopefully you'll find that we can move from the legacy models of what we're thinking about to a more complete model that'll be helpful for you today. Now, before that, let's get to a word from today's sponsor, which is us, CISO Tradecraft. We create weekly podcasts, as you know, to help our listeners increase their knowledge on cybersecurity. Now, if you love learning from us, try hiring us, perhaps, for consulting services. We have a variety of virtual CISO services that we can offer, such as helping you create or update your cybersecurity strategy, leading tabletop exercises with executives to simulate how your organization would respond to a cyber attack performing process improvement activities to fix processes that need improvement such as third-party procurement, vulnerability management, or third-party risk assessments. And additionally, we also perform custom coaching to help you become a stronger CISO. If any of these items are something you'd like to outsource and get help on, contact us at CISOTradecraft.com or send us a note on our LinkedIn profiles. Well, I said I'm going to be talking about acronyms, so let's go back with some uh, older ones. So pre-1990, we had things such as AI, MFA, EPP, Endpoint Protection, and MSB, Managed Security Service Providers. Some of these things I was kind of surprised to see. They were around before 1990. How about AI? You know who coined that term? That was John McCarthy in 1955 when he was at Dartmouth College doing a summer session. And he also, by the way, invented the LISP programming language in 1958 for those of you who like parentheses. Now, post-2015, we have had in the last 10 years new things like MDR, uh, ZTNA for Zero Trust Networks, XDR. And there's probably going to be more acronyms that come by, but notice that a lot of these things are technology-focused, either product or a particular uh, line of you know, things we could plug in or turn on. Now, there's some management acronyms, if you will, that describe processes. For example, STRIDE. Have you heard of that? Spoofing, hampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. The STRIDE acronym reminds us the ways to identify threats by classifying the attacker's goals. Now, Microsoft's threat model, you've probably heard of it, called DREAD. Damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, discoverability. These five represent a metric by which you can score them from 1 to 10, add them all up, divide by 5, and then you get an average score. And that's going to give us a feel for how bad this threat particularly might be. Anybody's on incident response probably knows Pickerel. Preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, lessons learned, P-I-C-E-R-L. And as I always remind people, you got to contain before you eradicate. That's a huge mistake that if you make that, your life's going to get really difficult. More recently, we've seen some good ideas come from MITRE. MITRE has the attack and their defend model. The attack, which has sort of an ampersand for the second A, is adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. And what we find then is this is a knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques. If you looked at it, it's great. If you haven't, you should, because it breaks things out into ways of look, these are the different tactics that things could be taken place, of the techniques that are going to be used by bad guys to get things done. And we can classify bad actors based upon that, almost like a heat map. So we can see if we had multiple attackers who might be coming at us using the same type of approach, and we could defend there. Uh, the MITRE DEFEND, which is D3FEND, stands for Detection, Denial, and Disruption Framework Empowering Network Defense. It's really a knowledge graph of cybersecurity countermeasures as compared to measuring what the attackers can do. And it's interesting because an organization called Fourcore combines these two into an equation that says attack plus defend equals death, detection, engineering, and threat hunting. So you too can have your own cybersecurity acronym if you're willing to go ahead and you know, publish it and push it out the door, which is kind of what we're doing here with ours. Now, over time, we've seen threats, defenses, strategies, and tools evolve. And with that evolution, we create new ways to organize and remember key points, often in the form of acronyms. Now, today, I want to get you thinking about what's important and perhaps lead you not to just take for granted what's already there, but identify models or associations that make sense for us as cybersecurity leaders. Now, to start, Let's re-examine a few fundamental terms that are important when we talk about cybersecurity. How about we define the term cybersecurity itself? Well, I'm not going to define it. I'm going to turn to somebody else. So the National Security Presidential 
Directive 54 or Homeland Security Presidential Directive 23. Okay, so PD-54 or HSPD-23, as we call them in uh, shorthand, the cybersecurity policy that was released on the 8th of January 2008, and then later quoted in this special publication 853 Rev 5, uh, which is the security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations, uh, OMB Circular A130, managing information as a strategic resource, all these use the same definition of cybersecurity, and that's the following. Prevention of damage to, protection of, and restoration of computers, electronic communication systems, electronic communication services, wire communication, and electronic communication, including information contained therein, to ensure its availability, integrity, authentication, confidentiality, and non-repudiation. Okay, it's a pretty comprehensive dictionary definition. We kind of expect that from the government. Now, with CISA Tradecraft, we like to use language that translates a little bit better to the business and other perhaps non-technical audiences. So let's redefine what we just heard a little bit differently. How about this? Cybersecurity is a business of revenue protection. Cybersecurity is about understanding, managing, communicating, and mitigating the risk of critical data and business processes being disclosed, confidentiality, altered, integrity, or denied availability. I don't think you'll find anybody who would say, I don't want to fund a part of my organization that is in the business of revenue protection. So if we try and do also redefine and reposition ourselves away from just a pure cost center where we just throw money at it to say, hey, there's some real value that comes back out. See, if you listen to our definition, there's some subtle differences. First, cybersecurity is it is about revenue protection. It means that defenses need to be cost effective. For example, you wouldn't put a $5,000 alarm system on a bolt beater car, but it might make sense if you had a McLaren P1 GTR. Haven't heard of that car? Look it up. It's awesome. Also a little bit out of my price range. To effectively enforce cybersecurity, you have to know the value of the business process or information you're protecting. And again, reinforcing the notion that effective cybersecurity leaders are also business leaders. That's you. And what this entails is the ability to make and influence informed risk-based decisions. Now, next, our definition of cyber highlights three important concepts, which together are commonly known as the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, not the Central Intelligence Agency. Although, but let's look at the CIA triad a little bit closer. Confidentiality is defined in the NIST glossary as, quote, preserving authorized restrictions on information access and disclosure, including means for protecting personal privacy and proprietary information. Now, the problem is, how do you measure confidentiality? I think you really can't. I mean, there isn't a way to say my system is completely confidential. Every system has a different amount of approved business users who can access the system, right? On one system, it could be 10 users. On another, it could be thousands. Now, we apply access control concepts, such as least privilege or zero trust, but that's also a little bit hard to measure. I submit the following. Confidentiality is a goal, not a state. The system can be configured confidential, even if the owners don't yet realize it's already been compromised. You see, we can assert that the controls in place have reduced the probability of unauthorized disclosure to an acceptable level of risk, but a rogue or blackmailed employee is a non-technical source of compromise that beats all the technical controls in your deck. Sort of like the old adage, Smith & Wesson beats four aces. Number two, integrity. Integrity is defined by NIST as guarding against improper information modification or destruction and includes ensuring information, non-repudiation, and authenticity. Data that is altered or corrupted creates headaches for both the IT team that needs to restore it as well as a business that depends upon it. But once again, we find there isn't a metric that IT application teams can use to say how much integrity is there in a system. Is it 100%? Is it 99%? Worse than that, it's nearly impossible to know. Now, this does represent one of the stronger business cases for blockchain, where alteration of recorded data becomes computationally infeasible. However, the alteration occurred before it was memorialized in a blockchain, and then that's lodged in there for the lifetime of that data set. All right, so we can talk about blockchain some other time. Number three, availability. 
Availability is defined by NIST as ensuring timely and reliable access to and use of information. Aha, finally, something we can actually measure. IT departments have routinely been measuring high availability uptimes in nines for years, often service level agreements, SLAs, will specify a percentage with a bunch of nines. Perusal of Microsoft's SLA show their most reliable guarantee is 99.999%, but only for a very expensive, redundant configuration. Now, for consideration, 99% or two nines, guaranteed uptime equates to 1% acceptable downtime. And that might sound pretty good, but that means 3.65 days out of the year, your e-commerce website could be down or your order entry system. And it could happen on Black Friday. That might not be acceptable to your business. 99.5% or 295 is 1.83 days per year. Three nines is 8.77 hours. Four nines is 52 minutes. Five nines, like we saw that with Microsoft, 5.26 minutes per year allowable downtime. And as expensive as that redundancy may be, Imagine the impact of the New York Stock Exchange lost five minutes of trades. Now, usually what happens in this case is that trading is halted for some time. It could be because of an IT outage or if there's a huge imbalance in buy-sell orders for a particular security or a limit up or a limit down is reached. The point here is that loss of availability does not have to necessarily be due to a cyber event. It can be deliberate. And one of the first people who proposed extending the traditional CIA triad was the late Don Parker. In 1998, Don proposed the Parkerian Hexad, which added the attributes of authenticity, possession or control, and utility to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, today, NIST includes authenticity in its definition of integrity, like we heard a few minutes ago, but consider that this is a slightly different concept. Integrity means the information has not been altered. Authenticity means it was valid from the beginning. It's the difference between a forged signature and an altered signature on a document. Knowing the origin of information or verifying its authorship, for example, with a private key signature, is an important cybersecurity concept. Well done, Don. Possession or control refers to whether another party could access certain information. Back in May of 2006, a VA laptop containing PII of millions of veterans was stolen from an employee's home. The information was unencrypted. However, the VA claimed that their forensic examination determined the files were never accessed, so although the data were in possession or control of the thief, there really was no breach of confidentiality. Ironically, after that, they had an order went out to encrypt all the hard drives. A few years later, what happened? VA had another laptop lost, and it was unencrypted, and they found out that about 80 to 90 percent of the tools that were purchased and paid for were shelfware. Nobody was using them. So another whack on that before they finally realized, hey, this is pretty good. But possession or control is the second additional term of the Parkerian hexad, that is to say the six-sided thing. And the lastly, the concept of utility refers to the usefulness of the system or the data. For example, a lost encryption key to a database or a Bitcoin wallet is not a breach of confidentiality or integrity or availability because the database is still there. Yet its usefulness is impaired. I suppose in a way you could think of a DDoS attack as a utility attack, right? The web server and the website are still there. There are some connections that are likely present to valid users, but it's not useful for its intended purpose. And therefore its utility fails. So you could debate these points over an adult beverage at your next security conference or accept the concepts as being generally useful. Don never got a lot of traction on the Parkerian Hexad, maybe because the name just sounded tough to pronounce or whatever, uh, but nonetheless, his concepts I thought were quite good. Randy Bias says he was inspired by a January 2012 Bill Baker presentation on scaling SQL Server to think of servers and IT infrastructure as cattle, not pets. And he used a simple elevator pitch like this to convey the concept. In the old way of doing things, we treat our servers like pets. For example, Bob the Mail Server. If Bob goes down, it's all hands on deck. The CEO can't get his email, and it's the end of the world. In the new way, servers are numbered like cattle in a herd. For example, www001 to www100. When one server goes down, it's taken out bat, shot, and replaced on the line. 
Now, one of the benefits of cloud computing and DevOps is that it's much easier to start up with a new instance to replace a malfunctioning virtual server than to try to debug it while it's in production. And more recently, Sunil Yu, who appeared on CISO Tradecraft episodes 82 and 83 to talk about the cyber defense matrix, recommends organizations look at the DIE triad. And DIE stands for distributed, immutable, and ephemeral. Now, let's dive into those terms just a little bit. Distributed. If we want to achieve high availability, what we're saying is that if the server dies, we want to spin up another server to replace it so as not to lose availability. That underlying concept can be achieved easily in the cloud. and We implement load balancers in front of multiple EC2 web servers. If the load balancer detects the server is dead, it'll redirect traffic to one that's not. And this way we distribute the workload and we achieve higher availability. By spinning up servers all the time through elastic load balancing, you can also handle times of high performance and high demand and then scale down to avoid the cost of running excess servers when the demand is lower. To achieve higher availability, we can do three things. One is increase the number of instances to which we can grow via auto-scaling. The second is to add more availability zones. And that way, if one goes down, we can fall over to another availability zone. The third option is to distribute servers across multiple regions. So if somehow one entire region goes down, we just point to one that isn't. And by using this approach, we can increase our availability to multiple nines. Now, here's what an implementation of that strategy might look like. We'll configure EC2 servers to run in two AWS regions. Let's say AWS Northern Virginia and AWS Ohio. Now, it's a pro tip. Remember that AWS regions may have different pricing models. Northern Virginia tends to be the cheapest, so consider that using that as your primary region to lower your costs, unless you have a data locality requirement. Now, within each AWS region, we'll use three different availability zones. And with each, in each availability zone, we can auto-scale the number of servers from 1 to 10. Now, this combination of multi-region, multi-availability zone, and auto-scaling creates a highly distributed and available system configuration that is highly resistant to downtime. So that's distributed, the D. The I is immutable. Data that's read-only is not susceptible to data integrity attacks. For example, if attackers could obtain read-only privileges to our data, but that's it, they can't edit, they can't encrypt, they can't delete the data. Now, this offers a lot of protection in the event of the traditional ransomware attack, but not so much assurance in the case of double extortion ransomware, where attackers exfiltrate sensitive data and then threaten to disclose it on pastebin or even hand it to the regulators who can issue significant fines or penalties. Now, the twist is that the ransom demand is significantly less than the regulatory fine. So paying the ransom is a great financial deal. <laughs> Making data immutable can lower the impact of an attack, at least the primary one, instead of just the likelihood. Okay, the E final term is ephemeral. The big problem with sensitive data is that once it's stolen, you usually have to declare a data breach. Now consider the common authenticator application as an example of ephemerality and a way to reduce data loss issues. The traditional approach, which dates back to the secure ID card invented by Security Dynamics back in 1986, generates a six-digit pseudo-random number, or PRN, that will change periodically. Today, it's usually every 30 seconds. A user would require both a correct password and an unexpired pseudo-random number to complete a login sequence. Now, a little quick trip down memory lane, the NSA did a product evaluation of the Security Dynamics Access Control Encryption, ACE, system in 1987. Uh, the link's in the show notes. And of interest, the original product featured a duress code, whereby a user could go ahead and provide a specific duress number in place of the current pseudo-random number, and the login would connect. It's just that no information associated with the account would be available, and an alarm was sent to the administrator. Seems like a pretty good idea. I think we've lost that. Also, there's a race condition where if two logins with the same valid PRN occurred, only the first one would win, which means if somebody's shoulder surfing you and they're trying to log in, they see your password, and they get your PIN. If you beat them to the enter key, then they get locked out. Today, I don't know. You have to check that. See, maybe they'll let both of them in. A couple other stories. It was interesting because I had uh, looked at this way back in the day, back in 19... 87, I did a source code review on this uh, with Security Dynamics. Drove out to Boston, took a look at it, reviewed it, and said, like, this looks like really cool stuff. And, uh, of course, it became its own industry, if you will. RSA eventually acquired them. And then the 
patents expired and, and pretty much everybody's using it. But essentially what it does is it'll take a seed and like the identity of a device, combine those two, run them through a generator, kind of like uh, an RC4 hashing type thing. I don't know if that's exactly the same, but slightly different. And so every peri time periodicity, it would generate a new pseudorandom number and a new one, a new one. So if you happen to know the key and you happen to know the identity of that device, you could follow along. And that's exactly what the servers did. And so what would happen was, back then you could configure your device. And what's interesting is I remember you paid more money if it changed quicker and you got more digits. So if you wanted more digits, you paid more. If you wanted to go every 30 seconds instead of every one minute, you paid more, which is interesting because this exact same device running pretty much the same code. You're just branching around it. But nonetheless, that was a business model and it worked pretty well. So what happened is early on as one of the early customers is this. They had the ACE server running on the, the you know, mainframe. Uh, that's what you had back in the 80s. And uh, it was keeping track and it was synchronized with these little tokens. And if one kind of time drift a little bit, we find out that all of a sudden it's like a second late, okay, or maybe two seconds, because these cars might not have perfect clocks. And as you start to drift a little bit, as long as you drift consistently, you could go ahead and follow it. But we wouldn't go very more than a second or two or three. Well, what came up was one situation is that, well, third shift is in there. We're doing the normal mainframe things. And what do we do at daylight savings time? Spring forward, fall back. So they spring forward, time to adjust the clock forward one hour. They did so at which point the software that was running on the server was now one hour in the future compared to the rest of all the devices that were used to log in and nobody could get in. And they're locked out. And they're like, hey, guys, you need to fix this. They're like, oh, yeah, we didn't think about that. Yeah, this is why version 1.1's come out. So what they had to do over at Security Dynamics is they had to take the algorithm and basically speed it up to run one hour in the future. So you could synchronize with it, you could log into it, and then change the time clock. So after that, they moved to their own dedicated ACE server, and then they didn't have the time problems anymore. Uh, the other interesting thing was that report that I mentioned that's in the notes was the National uh, uh, Computer Security Center, the NCSC. I had orders to that back um, in the mid-'80s to go work for, for the agency. I never ended up taking them because I was given these various... Uh, bad vibes given from the Navy saying, oh, we don't want you to go to NSA. Why would you do that? To do computer security. And I think I've shared this on the show before. My detailer, person owns by Kurt, 1984. The Navy has no need for computer security. You're going back out to sea. So I ended up not going to NSA, but that would have been the cool stuff I could have been working on. So you look at kind of the butterfly effect in your life and you say, where could you have been if you went a different way 20 or 30 years ago? Part of the reason I have a passion for doing the show, trying to share with you the experiences that I've had over a lifetime to be able to say, here's where I think I did it right. Here's where I could have done a little bit better. Maybe you can make a better decision. So if that all works for you, this is worth all of the effort. Now, if we go back and we think about this ephemerality about the secure ID card or the typical MFA that we have today, the value of this approach is that a compromised MFA credential is only valid for a few seconds. Bad actor has a very limited window within which to complete a login. Now, although the pseudorandom number, or PRN, is something you know, it can only be generated by the algorithm present in the token hardware or software. So it really is a different authentication factor, something you have. And combining that with the ephemerality of its validity, we can see why MFA is often cited as an effective way to prevent unauthorized logins. Just recently, we heard that the SEC and even Microsoft suffered breaches due to lack of MFA. So if you're not using MFA, turn it on right now, especially, especially, especially for admins. So that's DIE, distributed, immutable, and ephemeral. Now that we're into the acronym building like CIA or DIE, we could probably come up with a set of terms that fit into the acronym DIE hard, or even DIE you gravy sucking pig. But we'd like to propose a useful acronym as an update to cybersecurity. And that's why we're creating an acronym called the Cyber Update. The acronym stands for unchanging, perimeterizing, distributing, authenticating and authorizing, tracing, and ephemeralizing. All right, let's go into each one of these things and see how useful they're going to be for you. If we want our applications to be unchanging, then we should think about how we can apply the concept of encryption and access control. By using strong encryption, we can prevent man-in-the-middle attacks, packet sniffing, and even session hijacking. We see this in the HTTPS protocol. 
And so using TLS 1.2 or 1.3, the public, you're not using anything before that, I hope. The public key cryptographic exchange between the server and the browser is used to initiate an encrypted session that cannot be decrypted by a bad actor. Now, a man in the middle could alter the packets, but they fail to validate cryptographically and the attacker's presence is now detected. And additionally, we can apply the concept of limiting access to read-only to make something that just doesn't change. For example, use read-only containers. Bad actors won't have the ability to add, delete, or modify anything in that container. So that's our first letter, which is going to be unchanging. Our next term is perimeterizing. The classic example of a perimeter was a walled city with a drawbridge and a moat. And citizens were allowed in and out through the lower drawbridge, but if an enemy approached, in came the people and up went the drawbridge. Now, attackers could conduct a siege by surrounding the city and starving out the occupants, but that took a long time. It didn't scale very well. Uh, but that strategy is similar to our traditional firewall, where a lot of allowed or denied IP addresses and protocols determine what came in and out of our digital drawbridge. Now, at the 1990 Summer Usenic Conference in Anaheim, uh, Bill Cheswick described the networks at AT&T as a hard, crunchy shell around a soft, chewy center. Um, his point is that once you're through the shell, or the Trojans bring the Greek horse through the gate and, and go to bed, there's no defense to impede an attacker. Now, today's skilled bad attackers don't hack in. They log in. Phishing, phishing, smishing, password spray attacks, all of these are designed to get the user to surrender a valid login credential. And in a way, this is a nod to the effectiveness of traditional firewalls. Attackers are going after the carbon elements of the network, not the silicon. And so as a result, what we're seeing that we need to accept the concept of the perimeter has changed. Zero trust assumes that there is no perimeter, and thus all communication must be authenticated and encrypted to be considered valid. Now, cloud computing moves significant IT resources outside the traditional perimeter. So should we just believe the adage that there is no perimeter and the perimeter is dead? Long live the perimeter? Well, I used to say that there is no perimeter in many of my talks and presentations over the years, but just because our IT architecture has changed doesn't mean the concept of a perimeter is no longer useful. I mean, what does it mean if we say we have to update our concept of a perimeter to include more than just network layer three? For example, if we connect our private on-premises systems to software as a service services that are multi-tenant, then IP address permit denialists are not as an effective line of defense in and of themselves. If we connect a private server to a multi-tenant service, such as Microsoft 365 or Salesforce, then a bad actor can use their own Microsoft 365 or Salesforce environment to satisfy the IP address requirement. And also sometimes the source requirement coming from on Microsoft and things like that. I had a big problem a few months back uh, with a huge amount of spam getting through because it was coming from on Microsoft, a uh, different tenant, kind of a random thing there. Uh, Microsoft fixed it, but for a couple of weeks they couldn't stop it and huge amounts of junk was coming through because a bad actor can figure this out. They'll satisfy the IP address, they'll satisfy the URL of the source domain, and they won't trigger the alarms when they're sending you bad emails or phishing emails or even accessing or exfiltrating the data from your server. See, multi-tenancy means traditional perimeters are insufficient. Now, do we abandon layer three firewalls entirely? Absolutely not. What we need to do is understand where the perimeter is. Now, in many cases, the perimeter can fall back it can be applied to devices, networks, applications, data, and even user identity level systems and controls. Now, one thing that I do is I enable Microsoft Azure Directory conditional access policies. And they ensure that an authorized user is coming from an authorized device, coming from an authorized IP range belonging to a country within which we do business before a login is approved. Our third term in the update is D for distributing. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to defer to my earlier description of Sunil Yu's distributed leg of the DIE triad, and I'm not going to repeat myself on the concept. So let's go to our fourth term for A, authenticating. Authentication is the process or action of proving or showing something to be true, genuine, or valid. Now, we apply this concept to users by first authenticating them against a known set of valid criteria 
before providing access to a system or resource. Now, there's three traditional authentication factors, and in recent years, we can even apply a fourth. Multiple instances of the same factor don't add a lot of security, but applying multiple factors does. I remember USAA used to say, enter your user ID, got it, enter your password, right? Enter your secret phrase, one of three, whatever. It's like, that's still something you know, something you know, something you know, something you know, which is really the first authentication factor. Something you know. It could be a password, it could be a PIN, it could be a challenge question. Uh, whatever it is, that it's something that you could write down on the yellow sticky and put it on the bottom of a keyboard. And that's a traditional password. And that was good initially, but it turns out that, well, people can guess passwords. They write them down. They get them compromised. They use weak passwords. If you look at the NIST 863B, uh, which is for the password management, it no longer says change your password every 30, 60, 90 days. In fact, it says don't do that because people pick really bad passwords. They put one or two or three at the end of them and they don't get any better. And then they write them down and it gets even worse. Instead, use things like MFA, which is where we get to the second authentication factor, something you have, such as a key or a badge or a cell phone running an authentication application. You know, the third one we have then is something you are, usually a biometric identifier, such as a fingerprint, face ID, or even a retina scan. And the fourth one, which is kind of new in the last few years, is some place you are. And that's been enabled either by GPS or a known IP address range. Now think about it. If I just get password after password, you know, same user has to provide four passwords. So theoretically, every character of your password would be a, a separate entity. You get anyone wrong, it shouldn't work. So that doesn't help. But think about what happens when you go from a password to then having to have a badge to scan in. It's even better. Now, when I used to work at highly classified spaces, you would have to go ahead, take your badge, scan the badge, something you have, enter in your PIN, and then put on some biometric and you had three different authentication factors that were required to get into this highly sensitive space. And that made sense because each one combined with the others reduced the probability that you get a false accept and someone would get through. Now, just something to think about in the way this fifth factor might be time. Remember we're talking about the temporary validity of an MFA token? And the more different factors you apply, the higher the assurance of authenticity. Now let's see how MFA could be applied with Microsoft Active Directory. We can set up Microsoft Active Directory to make a user log in with a username and a password, and then provide an MFA code from the Microsoft Authenticator application. That's two factors so far, but we can do more than that. If a user logs in from a work laptop, we can verify the certificate on the laptop to make sure it's coming from an approved device. And that's a third factor. Now, if a bad actor obtained an ID, a password, and even successfully fished a user for an MFA token value. Don't think that's not true because in the last month I've dealt with two users who had been basically bamboozled out of their MFA factor and I had to go ahead and do an incident. But the login would still fail because they didn't come from an approved device. In addition, we can restrict logins by country. But we, we deselect all the countries for which we do not approve logins to further complicate intruders. Now, if your attackers are sophisticated, they can use a public VPN and get a US-based point of presence. But then you can be even more sophisticated and block all the IP addresses associated with VPN exit nodes. Well, then the attacker can move to the cloud so we can play cat and mouse all day long. But the goal is to block the majority of attackers and then deal with the wiliest ones individually. Helps a lot. Our fifth term in our acronym for T is one we don't hear enough about, tracing. We need traceability for our systems, and that means we want logs. Remember, just because a bad actor got into your system doesn't necessarily mean you've had a data breach. Now, if you have log traffic that demonstrates that no data was exfilled, then you have a cyber incident, but not a data breach. So if you're dealing with a requirement by HHS or even taking a look at the new SEC requirements, you can take a look at through that. And if you're confident with your ability to trace through it to say, hey, some bad actor says, yeah, we just stole two terabytes of data and we're going to ransom them for you. And you've got really good tracing, really good logs. You say, nowhere near that amount of information ever got out. They're just bluffing. And you can go ahead and then you can help your executive team make an informed risk-based decision as to whether or not to report or not. Of course, you want to get legal involved as well. But here's another thing to think about. What if you took away SSH? FTP and RDP from all of your servers. Well, then admins couldn't log in to troubleshoot, right? 
can only create logging mechanisms that are deployed in code. For example, admins could create a job that once every 10 minutes runs three Linux commands, VMstat, Netstat, and IOStat. Yeah. VMstat shows memory, processes, and CPU information. Netstat shows your network statistics, and IOStat shows storage input and output stats. And then you put monitoring on these logs. If something looks like a new IP logging in that's detected by Netstat, was it an approved change request if it's going to update something? If a server runs out of storage or memory, then you might have a memory leak or you need to increase the attached storage. See, smart logging and monitoring prevent availability issues because you can act on them pretty quickly and they can be used to spot confidentiality attacks. And additionally, if you turn off SSH, FTP, and RDP, you minimize your attack surface. If a zero-day attack arises that can perform a remote code execution attack on one of those services, you don't care because they're not enabled. You minimize the way bad actors can get into your system. So it's something to think about. The last thing of update, the E, the term is ephemeralizing. Similar to the DIE triad, we think we can help with confidentiality-based attacks by ephemeralization. Now, that's not to be confirmed with our Buck Minister Fuller's definition of that very same term in 1938. As the ability of technological advancement to do more and more with less and less until eventually you can do everything with nothing. We're going to borrow that term, however, uh, but in a different context. We expect more organizations to move to ephemeral access control. For example, we can leverage tools like IAM Access Analyzer that says, you know, how we gave a lot of users access to a lot of systems. Well, we've been watching those folks and we found out they only use about 10% of the granted permissions. So we think it's a good idea to remove the other 90%. If they need any of those accesses, again, just have the users submit another access request. Now, doing this means you can minimize the blast radius of how many things a bad actor can get to when one person falls for a fish. We can also do similar things on firewall rules. There's a lot of smart firewall technology that says, you know, you got 100 different firewall rules, but over last year, we only saw traffic trigger 25 of those 100 rules. The other 75 firewall rules aren't being used and I want to get rid of them to simplify you know, your process. Now you should always check these things. There might be a backup process that only runs once a year and you don't want to break that. So we need a big long test period sometimes. However, in general, this facilitates a least privileged approach that greatly strengthens your organization. So look for ways to ephemeralize your access control list at various layers device layer, application layer, network layer, data layer, and even the user and machine identities. Okay, so we hope you like our new acronym, which we call the Cyber Update. Once again, the update acronym stands for unchanging, perimeterizing, distributing, authenticating, tracing, and ephemeralizing. And thank you again for listening to another CISO Trade Draft podcast. Remember, it's important to understand the key concepts like the CIA triad, also important to see how concepts evolve to include the DIE triad and the Parkerian hexad. We hope you've enjoyed our recommendation to give your information security the cyber update it needs. Remember, if you enjoyed our show, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, your favorite platform. If you're not already following us or subscribing on LinkedIn, please do so. Also for YouTube, that helps us get noticed by other potential listeners and viewers with whom we can help on their CISO tradecraft journey. So until next time, this is your host, G. Mark Hardy. Thank you very much for being a part of our show and stay safe out there.